Memories of journeys long past ripple through the crystal shores of a Pacific paradise, reflecting images of the proud veterans they are today and the young, patriotic airmen they once were. Forging an iron resolve, the young men of the 11th Bombardment Group, known as the Grey Geese, began their journey into the unknown by spreading their wings high within the beautiful Pacific skies, skies they would soon have to defend. While the attack on Pearl Harbor by the Japanese is well documented, the story of what happened at Hickam Field that day to the 11th Bombardment Group has largely been untold. Well, December 7th, 1941 is probably one of the most significant dates in 20th century American history. And close to 2,500 people died at Pearl Harbor that day. So it's so important that we remember that they didn't die in vain, that they died for our liberty. Born in Hawaii, the 11th Bombardment Group was activated in February 1940 at Hickam Field. Representing the three original bombardment squadrons, the three gray geese in Chevron flight suggested aerial superiority and unit cohesiveness. In late 1941, as events in the Pacific escalated, the U.S. was quickly leaning towards a confrontation with Imperial Japan. In the meantime, for the young airmen stationed on Oahu, Hawaii was truly a tropical bliss. An assignment in Hawaii before the war truly was an assignment in paradise. Being stationed in Hawaii with the beaches and activities was just a fantastic place for the people to be. Uh, the men worked hard, but their time off was well spent with activities. Well, <laughs> duty in Hawaii could very well be classified as a country club living. It was, we had a lot of free time, things of that nature there, and of course, being in the Air Corps at that time over there, we uh, did our work, and as soon as our work was finished, we were allowed to go ahead off base. We had Class A passes and things of that nature. The relaxed mood of America's principal Pacific base was not unnoticed by Japan's military leaders especially Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Thus, the American nation was caught unprepared for war in December 1941. Had we been prepared, it wouldn't have happened. And I, yet the peculiar part of it is, about a month back in November of 1941, I had written my wife a letter, and she still has the letter, that is telling her that in all probability we're going to be attacked that it's got to happen, and it's going to be very, very soon. The Japanese planned to eliminate the U.S. naval fleet anchored at Pearl Harbor, as well as key airfields on Oahu, including the bomber base at Hickam Field. Utilizing the cover of darkness, they planned to strike American forces just after sunrise on Sunday, their day of rest. Uh, I will never refer to the attack on Pearl Harbor as a surprise attack. I will not ever refer to it as a brilliant naval plan. As far as I'm concerned, in memory of those who were killed, it was a sneak attack and it should never have occurred for all those reasons I mentioned. Unwary soldiers, sailors, marines, and airmen would be completely unprepared by an attack that would turn a peaceful Sabbath into the worst military disaster in American history. Well, I was still in bed at per and so my wife, who was in the kitchen getting his breakfast, and she asked me if I was going to go to church. 
I said, well, I don't know. I feel, don't feel like it. Then she said, what kind of airplanes are they? I said, well, I jumped out of bed and looked out and I saw that big old red dot on there and I told her the damn Japs. It was 7.55 a.m. when swarms of attacking Japanese planes dove on Hickam Field, striking without mercy. The first bomb that landed on Hickam landed on the Hawaiian Air Depot. It was a very surgical strike. They hit what they wanted to hit. For example, none of the homes on Hickam was damaged during the attack. Many airmen were still sleeping in the sprawling new barracks known as the Halamakai, or the Hotel by the Sea, and never knew what hit them. I thought the barracks would uh, collapse. The uh, large pillars that supported were just bending like this. And um, my idea was to get out of the barracks in case it collapsed. My little uh, tailor-made flight cap that was on uh, fell off, and I stopped and picked that up, and uh, they were coming over at about 200 feet, machine gunning us and dropping these 25-pound uh, daisy cutter bombs on us. And um, two guys were mowed down right to the side of me, and I, and I would suppose if I hadn't been bent over picking up my cap that I would have got it too there. but. Um, When the bomb hit, I saw the uh, track of these big heavy doors come off of the track and the concussion blew me out about 40 feet. And then another bomb hit and it just picked me up and slammed me back into the concrete. Then a few minutes later they started strafing and I picked up a couple of machine gun bullets while I was laying out there. As black clouds rolled upwards from destroyed targets all across the island, a formation of B-17s fresh from the United States were preparing to land at Hickam Field, unaware and unarmed. About that time, the men from the boathouse yelled, come on over, help me get the machine guns we have here. We drug them up on top of the boathouse and we tried to get them working. The one jammed all the time. About that time, some B-17s were coming in from the States without any armament on them. There was a Jap plane right on the sky's tail. Finally, the gun worked good, and we shot this plane down over Fort Cam. Boy, was that a good feeling to see that we at least got one. Heroism was quite common that morning. One of the maintenance personnel climbed into the nose of a B-18 and began firing at the attacking Japanese. The aircraft was soon hit with incendiaries and began to burn, but he made no move to escape, but rather stayed at the gun and fired. You could hear him screaming in the end as the aircraft was totally consumed. It was heroism like that that led the men for the rest of the war as they remembered what their comrades had suffered on that fateful morning. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The damage inflicted by the Japanese that day was catastrophic. Losses suffered by the 11th Bomb Group at Hickam Field were devastating. The Grey Geese suffered 245 casualties out of its 350-man flock. I had friends, good friends, when I came to, uh, to the 11th Bomb Group. And I saw some of them die. It's not a pretty thing. It's not a pretty thing. Some, some people, some people you didn't know too well, yet they, you, you saw. I saw sights I hope I never see again. I was one of the lucky ones, and I'm, 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 God was with me, or somebody, somebody was watching over me because I was in the middle of it. Despite the terrible destruction that laid waste at Hickam, the American flag, old glory, torn, tattered, and bullet-ridden, continued to wave proudly. Amid the incomprehensible losses sustained from the crippling Japanese attack, James Lancaster saw a blessing in disguise. If the B-18s had been able to get off that day 
we would have shot every damn one of them down and we would have lost a cruise on every one of those, uh, those airplanes. Now you can build an airplane in just a few months, but it takes 21 years to grow a pilot. So I think we were fortunate. And it was those spared 11th Group air crews, able to fight yet another day, who kept hope alive when all seemed lost. God bless the Air Force for what they did. They had to earn their wings the hard way, and they sure did. You take the members of the 11th Bomber Group, they went out after the raid was over, searching for the uh, remnants of the Japanese fleet. They put their lives on the line, and both the, those of the 11th Bomber Group and those of Wheeler Field are to be commended, and we, the rest of the servicemen, are extremely proud to be associated with them. The 11th Bomb Group was heavily victimized during the Pearl Harbor attack, and I think this, this uh, caused within the men of that group a very special desire to come to grips with the enemy and to show the enemy that they were not victims but victors. And certainly if you take a look at what happened with the 11th Group after Pearl Harbor, their wartime record was spectacular. Rebounding quickly from the Japanese attack, the survivors of the 11th regroup with courage and steadfast resolve to carry the fight to Japan. The B-17 was, was a very tough airplane, as we found out during the midway and down through the South Pacific. I think there were about three or so airplanes that we flew that never flew again. They were shot up so badly that we had to park them and use them for parts. The 11th Bomb Group in World War II started the war with the B-17 and they wound up the war with the B-24. These were two remarkable airplanes. In 1943, the airmen of the 11th were retrained and reassigned to fly the B-24 Liberator, which gave them long-range capabilities, proving to be most effective for the war in the South Pacific. Crews like the Jeterbug tested both their aircraft and themselves every time they launched, facing dangers across the Pacific. We loaded our own bombs. We loaded our own ammunition. And we flew the mission and then came back and cleaned our equipment. Now, they don't do that today. This is, it's, it's not only a camaraderie, it's a singleness of purpose that everybody has to do a job and do it right. Very dedicated bunch. Bombing one island after another, the Grey Geese demonstrated a lethal execution and effectiveness in their missions throughout the Pacific. We were doing a job to end a war. We didn't want to jeopardize lives. We didn't want to lose any. Fortunately, we had a group of ground crew members in the 11th group who were doing excellent jobs. January 1, 1944, I was grounded. I was sick at that time there, and my crew took off without me on a, on a flight that is on a bombing mission to Maloalap. Little did Jack Wagner know that on the one mission he missed, his crew had crash-landed and would never return. How did I feel about the loss? It's like losing, losing part of yourself. It was a type... It was a time that you, you're flying with the guys, each one depending on one another. And I think the most devastating time was when my intelligence officer came up to me and said, Jack, would you, would you stop packing the guys' gear together and make an inventory of that? Here I was in the tent with the whole crew. That was the only survivor. And for, for many, many years after, I always had the feeling that had I been with them, they might have been survived, they might have survived. When the chips were down and the mission was at stake, it was strength of spirit among the gray geese that brought them through the war and continues to this day. Well, I had a heart attack and I was in intensive care. 
And of course, only immediate family can, can communicate when you're in intensive care. And one day or just the day after the heart attack, why uh, the nurse comes to Wanda and says, uh, does he have a brother in Chicago? And Wanda said, oh yes, yes. And then about 10 minutes later, why here's a call from Sammy. Does he have a brother in Honolulu? And she says, oh yes, yes, yes. Well, all the crew phoned. And yeah. of course, I had to tell the nurse, I said, I was on a flying crew in, uh, in, during World War II. And I said, these are my brothers. I said, we're, we're, we're family. And she says, well, I was wondering how you could have a, a Dick David as a brother, a Sam Tillery as a brother, a Doyle Evil as a brother. I said, well, I didn't have a mother that had a lot of husbands, but I said I had a crew that we all love each other. And I said, uh, that's it. I said, we're, we're that close. We're brothers. Although advancing in years, the members of the 11th Bomb Group have remained a close fraternity. Strengthened by the Japanese attack on Hickam Field, and their courageous journey to victory in the Pacific. Uh, when we're in a festive group, we get together and uh, somebody will start singing the song and the whole group picks it up. The uh, song of the 11th Bomb Group is Remember Pearl Harbor as we go to meet the foe. Remember Pearl Harbor as we did the Alamo, and so on and so on. And all this gunfire around us, so it was about six of us. Through the association, members continue to develop friendships with their comrades. An important part of the association is planning their annual reunion, including returning to the island they once knew as paradise. Every fifth year, we went to Hawaii. And that was always, always a, uh, a hard place to go to, really. Uh, we, went, we all went to Hickam Field, I did. It uh, brought back a lot of, lot of memories, and uh, a lot of good memories and a lot of bad memories. Those never to be forgotten memories remain as well as the scars of bursting bombs and piercing shrapnel are still visible today at Hickam Air Force Base. Most prominent though is the bullet scarred 3200 man barracks, now the headquarters building for the Pacific Air Force Command. But for some members of the 11th Bomb Group, it will always be where they lived, where they slept, and for one day where their dreams were shattered. Well, I was on the second floor of the barracks, which is this right here, and I was on the other side and came on this side to see what was going on. There was a lot of noise going on, and I seen some planes flying by these wings, and all of a sudden I saw one coming right down the middle of this wing, and I hollered at my buddy and I said, you know what? He's got a, he's got a bomb on his belly and he's going to drop that damn thing. And I, that's exactly what you said then. See? So then I came on down, and I came over here, and I looked at this here after it went off, and this is the result of what took place that morning. A lot of shrapnel holes is what they are. Each year, many members like Bob May make their way to the annual yeah, December 7th ceremony at Hickam Air Force Base, hosted by the 15th Air Base Wing. They have an opportunity to share in the warm friendships made through the years and pay special tribute to those unfortunate gray geese who did not survive that December morning. This monument represents the 11th bomb group deceased. It was put together in the mainland and flown over here at considerable expense to the association and it means a whole lot to all of us that were in the 11th bomb group. We have an 11th Bombardment Group Association reunion every year 
Uh, we're coming close to the end of it because of the advanced age of most of us in, in the organization. We, we know, know for sure just when it's going to end, but we, it could end soon. While the reunions and the association may very well end soon, their spirit will live on forever. History is very important for any organization, but it's particularly important for military organizations. With history, you understand where you have been, so you understand very well where you are. And that gives you the launch point for determining where you're going in the future. In 1994, the Air Force District of Washington, headquartered at Bowling Air Force Base in Washington, D.C., was redesignated the 11th Wing to honor and preserve the proud heritage created by the men of the 11th Bombardment Group. I can hear the whispers of the angels I can hear their 